In this video, we're going to talk about subspaces. But first, I want to talk about subsets. A subset is just any collection of points. If I'm living, for example, in R2, then just some random collection like this is going to be a subset. However, if I'm going to be doing linear algebra, I want that all of the linear algebra that I'm defining is going to play nice with my two fundamental operations that I have on vectors. I can take a scalar multiple of a vector which stretches its length, or I can add two vectors together in this tip-to-tail manner. Those are my two basic operations that underpin everything that I do in linear algebra. And so the problem with a random subset like the one I've drawn is that if I choose some particular vector whose tip is going to end in this particular subset, and then I try to do one of the things on linear algebra to it, like how about multiply it out by two, then I leave this subset, and the subset doesn't have anything to do with this operation of multiplication by two. So I don't want to have just the old notion of a subset. I want to talk about a subspace. And in fact, a subspace is going to be something that, in some sense, respects the two fundamental operations in linear algebra. So I'm going to define it like this. That is, I'm going to say that a subspace is just a subset, so some random collection of elements, but additionally, it's going to obey a couple different properties. And I'm going to denote my subspace by H, but it's just some particular subset of wherever I happen to be living, in this case, Rn. So my first property is that it plays nicely with scalar multiplication. And here's what I mean by that. If I start with some vector and it's living inside of my subspace H, then suppose I take that vector and I stretch it out by a scalar, then that stretch vector is also in my subspace. So if X is in H, then it's going to be the case that the stretched vector CX is also inside of H, and that this is going to be true for all scalars C in the real numbers. In other words, it plays nice with stretching. The other operation I want to play nicely with is vector addition. In other words, if I got one vector that's in my subspace and I've got another vector in my subspace, I want that tip to tail addition to also be in my subspace. So I'm going to say, if I have two vectors now, it's an X and a Y, and they both live in my subspace, then I can take the vector X plus the vector Y and it is going to live in my subspace as well. The final one that I'm going to write down is that zero, the zero vector, is an element of H. This is mainly to get rid of like a weird trivial case, like the, the, the subspace that has absolutely no elements in it. If it had no elements at it all, we don't want to consider it as being a subspace, and it's going to help a couple of our theorems a little bit later, but this trivial subspace with nothing in it at all would technically vacuously obey the properties one and two. So I, even though three looks like it's a special case of one, it's slightly different because it's possible you could have had a completely empty subspace if I didn't write down property number three. Nonetheless, not particularly important, but you can use it to disprove that something's a subspace. You look at something, doesn't have the origin, not a subspace. Well, first example. What if my H was going to be, well, how about just absolutely everything? It's all of Rn. Well, this should automatically work because we know that if we take a vector and we stretch it, that's still in everything. If we add two vectors in Rn, that still remains a vector in Rn. Clearly, the zero vector is inside of Rn, so it obeys all three properties. The entire space is sort of, in a vacuous sense, a subspace. I have another really pointless and trivial one here, it's going to be H is the set that contains only the zero vector. This is indeed going to be a subspace. Well, let's check its three properties. One, if I take that zero vector and I stretch it by any scalar C, then it's going to be the case that C times zero, which is just zero, is inside of there. Likewise, if I take two vectors inside of my subspace, the only possibility is zero and zero, I add zero and zero, I get the zero vector, and then it's going to be in there as well. And thirdly, the zero vector is inside of there. So this is also clearly going to be a subspace. 
Now the final one is going to be a little bit uh, less obvious and less trivial. Imagine I'm living in R2 and I want to think about what are the possible subspaces of R2. We already know that all of R2 is a possibility and we know that just the zero vector itself is a possibility, but what else is there? It turns out that all of the other possibilities are going to be straight lines. So let me define, I'm not going to call it H this time because I'm talking about line, I'll give it the special name L, and I'm going to write it L sub X to denote the line that goes through the X vector. And it's defined to be the following set. It's the set of all vectors Y, where that Y can be written as C times X for C being just some particular scalar. That is, we can imagine that I've got some particular vector, that's my X vector, and then what is going to be the line through X? Well, I'll do it in a dotted. It's all of these vectors where you take that line and you can stretch it out any amount. You can multiply any C to it. So now let's try to verify that this example of a straight line indeed satisfies these three properties. Well, for the first of the three properties, it's kind of trivial, right? Well, for the first of these three properties, it's actually completely trivial. If we look into how this thing was defined, it was defined so that if I multiply by a constant C, that I'm still going to be on the line. Like, the, the first property that we have here was, in a sense, a defining property of what it meant to be a line. So for sure, if I multiply by a constant, I'm going to get this result. So I'm going to say the first one is completely trivial. The second one is not trivial, however. It could be the case that I have a one vector which is represented as, I'll call it C1 times X. It's a scalar C1. And then I'm going to add to it a second scalar C2X. So both of these two vectors are on the line and both of them can be written as a constant times that same X, but they have different constants. Well, now I can add them together and I can do a little bit of algebra. I can say that this is equal to, well, let's pull out the C1 and the C2. And that's all multiplied by X. And what I have here is just going to be an element of the real numbers. It is another scalar. So it's kind of like if I go along the line some amount and I go along the line some other amount, if I add those two vectors together, I just get another vector which is line on the line. So indeed, it is, as we say, closed under vector addition, just as it was closed under scalar multiplication. And then the very final thing that we have to verify is that indeed, the origin is there. And if you just choose C equal to zero, then what you're going to get is that the zero vector is an element of the line through x. Indeed, you can sort of imagine it being right there. This is the line through x. I'm going to give one more example. This is an example where it is not going to be a subspace. That is, I want to consider lines that are not going through the origin. So the idea here is that if I have some particular axis, and I draw a line that is not going through the origin. Now you might look at this and be like, obviously this is not a subspace. It doesn't have that zero vector in it. Well, I agree. But I also want to note that that's not the only reason for it. The insistence of the zero vector is just sort of a, a nice, easy way to look at it. Because if I take a vector, how about this one here? That is a vector that goes to a point on the line. So it, that vector is included in this particular line. But if I multiplied it by a scalar, then it goes off in some direction. It has nothing to do with the line. So in fact, lines not through the origin, they break all three of my different properties. And they're not even remotely close to a subspace. So in linear algebra, we're going to make this really big distinction between lines through the origin and lines not through the origin. If we're to go up some dimensions, say three dimensions, the subspaces it's going to turn out are going to be all of the planes, but only planes that go through the origin. And in higher dimensions, we'll call these analogs hyperplanes.